March 9th, 2012, 2.26 a.m., RCMP get a call from a community in Dartmouth, Nova Scotia, called Portland Estates, about a report of a break and enter in progress at an address on Havenbrook Hill. When police arrived, they found Mr. Kevin Farron dead inside the residence. He was the victim of a homicide. The home Kevin was found at belonged to his client, Mohammed Rashidi. Kevin worked as an agent for Mohammed's company. Mohammed and his son were reportedly away when the murder occurred. Kevin Farron was born on November 20th, 1950. He worked as an accountant and was seemingly quite well liked. He didn't seem to have any enemies and he attended church regularly. At the time of his death, he lived in Waverly, Nova Scotia. He was 61 years old. He was known as a helpful person who had two brothers and three sisters. What really happened to Kevin Farron on the night of March 9th, 2012? Was he the victim of a break and enter gone awry? A case of just being in the wrong place at the wrong time? One Reddit user commenting on the case stated that Muhammad Rashidi may know more than he's saying and reportedly never explained why Kevin Farron had been at his home on March 9th at 2.26 in the morning. Any person with information regarding the homicide of Kevin Farron should call the Rewards for Major Unsolved Crimes program at one 710 9090 September 14th, 2017. RCMP respond to an address on Cherry Brook Road, Lake Loon, to a report of family members finding the body of Josiah Kalen Sparks. Police believe that Josiah Sparks met with foul play sometime between September 11th and September 14th of 2017. He was only 22 years old. Born in Halifax, Nova Scotia, Josiah Sparks was known as a well-mannered, kind, considerate, understanding, lovable, and respectable young man. Not only did he have a passion for cooking, but he was an active member of the Cherry Brook United Baptist Church. He was also a member of the Baptist Youth Fellowship and served as assistant treasurer for the group as well. Despite being a promising and popular person, Sparks also had brushes with the law. Court records show he was supposed to go to trial on charges of resisting arrest, assaulting a peace officer, and obstructing a police officer. He also had a previous conviction for assault, for which he received a conditional discharge. People in the area of Cherry Brook Road stated that they didn't hear or see anything unusual leading up to the discovery of Josiah's body, but Jonathan McIntosh, who lived across the street from where Josiah was found, said he saw a car pull up and leave just before police arrived on September 14th. Reportedly, Josiah Sparks had attended a gathering at a home on Cherry Brook Road at some point between September 11th and September 14th of 2017. RCMP would like to speak with anyone that may have seen him there. Anyone with information regarding the murder of Josiah Kalen Sparks should call the Provincial Rewards Line at one 710 9090 4.10 a.m., August 7, 2005. Jonathan Reeder is found by a municipal worker lying in the roadway at the intersection of Radcliffe Drive and Dunbrack Street in Halifax, Nova Scotia, just two blocks from his home. Jonathan Reeder was unconscious and bleeding when he was taken to the hospital by ambulance, where he died a short time later. Autopsy determined that Mr. Reeder had been murdered and that the cause of death was blunt force trauma. RCMP believed the homicide occurred at the location he was found. Investigations revealed that Jonathan had been in the downtown area of Halifax and attended the Pacifico Bar and Grill with friends before leaving at 1.57 a.m. with an unidentified female. He was last seen to be by himself at 3.20 a.m. on Dutch Village Road, walking toward Lacewood Drive. Jonathan's parents, Linda and David Reeder, 
told CBC back in 2011 that they believe their son was killed by a youth gang known as the Murda Squad. The readers also passed their information along to the police. I hope it shakes it up. I hope that those responsible in that group understand that the community now know who you are, said David Reeder. Police confirmed that Murda Squad was the focus of their investigation early on, and it hasn't been ruled out. We're a piece of information or two away from making an arrest, commented spokesman Constable Brian Palmer back in 2011. John's life was very important to us, and living without him is just unbearable, said David Reeder. And so to have this information and to have the community still there for us is wonderful. Any person with information regarding the murder of Jonathan Reeder should call the Rewards for Major Unsolved Crimes program at one 710 9090 April 27th, 2017, 1.09 p.m. Police respond to a report of a deceased female at an address on Farkasen Street, Dartmouth, Nova Scotia. When officers arrived at the scene, they discovered Lori Catherine Jollymore inside the address. Investigations revealed that Lori Jollymore was the victim of a homicide. At first, the call made to police indicated a report of a sudden death, but the following day, the medical examiner conducted an autopsy and ruled her death a homicide. Investigators believe there are people who have information who have not yet spoken to police that could help solve Lori Jollymore's murder, and believe that the passage of time may encourage someone to do the right thing and come forward. Lori Jollymore was 58 years old at the time of her death. Not much information is available on Lori Jollymore, but one Facebook user commenting on the case may be put at best stating, my thoughts and prayers are with her family and friends. Also, to anyone that does know something, just please come forward. No family member deserves to live in limbo. If this was a member of your family, you would hope someone came forward. You would want a bit of closure, I'm sure. Please do the right thing. Again, I wasn't able to find much information about the life of Lori Jollymore, but I can't help finding something terribly haunting about her eyes in this picture. There is something profound about them, yet they also seem to emanate a sense of troubled sadness, a sadness that is no doubt with her remaining loved ones every day. Anyone with information about the murder of Lori Catherine Jollymore should contact the rewards program at one 710 9090 August 28, 1985, Michael Leonard Ham was walking his dog on Windsor Street when an unknown male approached him and shot him in the head. Investigations revealed the victim left his residence on Tower Road before the shooting and was walking south on Windsor Street near Duncan when a lone killer ran up to him and fired a fatal shot. A suspect was seen running from the area. Mr. Ham had also been the victim of a previous shooting in May of 1985. While researching this case, I happened upon a series of fascinating blogs at toothyanker.blogspot.com titled Phyllis Borden, The Story of an Immoral Life. The blogs, written by the former son-in-law of one Phyllis Borden, detail the ruinous life of Phyllis Borden and her partner, Bobby Hamilton, According to Borden's son-in-law, Scott Rogers, Hamilton was a drug dealer. In May of 1985, Michael Ham, who knew Hamilton, attempted to rob Bobby Hamilton outside of a North End Halifax pub. When Hamilton was approached by Michael Ham and an unknown black male with a large dog, knowing he was about to be robbed, he pulled out a gun, fired, and struck Mr. Ham. Ham would survive as the bullet hit his belt buckle. The black male and dog ran off while Bobby Hamilton fled with then-girlfriend Phyllis Borden, going by Phyllis Keating at the time, to Moncton, New Brunswick to avoid RCMP. 
According to Rogers, Michael Ham got word to Bobby Hamilton that if Hamilton paid him $2,000, then Ham would tell police that Bobby was not the shooter. Hamilton apparently refused Ham's offer. Three months later, Michael Ham was dead. Did Bobby Hamilton kill his enemy, Michael Ham? Or did Ham's seemingly dangerous lifestyle get him into trouble with some other person or persons? For now, it's just another unsolved murder in Nova Scotia that will remain a mystery. Any person with information regarding the murder of Michael Leonard Ham should call the Rewards for Major Unsolved Crimes program at one 710 9090 April 25th, 2011. 21-year-old Nathan Ross Cross of North Preston was gunned down in a crowd outside a Churchill Terrace home. What's even more perplexing, this tragic killing occurred nearly a decade after his mother, Laura Lee Cross, was murdered in a case that has remained unsolved. When officers arrived at the scene of Mr. Cross's shooting at 6.30 p.m., they found Nathan Cross unconscious and unresponsive. Nathan Cross had been standing outside with a group of people when a suspect fired several shots that struck him. He would later die in an ambulance on the way to the hospital as a result of the gunshot wounds. It is widely reported that Cross was wearing body armor at the time of the shooting, which occurred outside a local fire hall. Cross ran from the scene but collapsed on a lawn on nearby Churchill Terrace. Laura Lee Cross, Nathan's mother, was discovered on October 14, 2002, when two hunters found skeletal remains off a logging road near Dollar Lake Provincial Park. In her last conversation with family on July 12, 2001, Laura Cross told them over the phone that she was going to catch a train that same day to visit her boyfriend in Bathurst, New Brunswick. She was never seen or heard from again. What really happened to Laura Lee and Nathan Ross Cross? For now, all we can be sure of is that a mother and son were tragically murdered in Nova Scotia almost a decade apart, and both of the killings still remain unsolved. Any person with information regarding the murder of Nathan Ross Cross should call the Rewards for Major Unsolved Crimes program at one 710 9090 <laughs> November 4th, 1991, a concerned father reports Leslie Ann Katnick missing to police in Montreal. Leslie had been living in Montreal, Quebec until November 1st, 1991, which was the last time she was seen by either friends or family. The investigation revealed that Leslie registered at the Halifax YMCA on November 2nd, 1991, for several nights and returned the key on November 4th, 1991. Leslie's bank card was also used in Halifax on November 2nd, 1991. No further information has come out with respect to Leslie's whereabouts. Leslie Ann was known for having a warm smile, sincerity, and a kind heart. The circumstances surrounding Leslie Katnick's disappearance are suspicious and foul play may very well be involved Investigators believe there are persons who have information about Leslie's disappearance. As mentioned in previous episodes, suspected Nova Scotian serial killer Andrew Paul Johnson, now locked up in BC, was a suspect in at least a dozen killings in Nova Scotia dating back to 1976. Johnson was investigated in connection with the disappearance of Kimberly McAndrew in 1989, the 1992 murder of Andrea King and the death of Stephen Michael Hall in 1996. In 1992, he pleaded guilty to confining and sexually assaulting his Halifax girlfriend. In 1997, he'd been caught masturbating in his car while watching girls play in Hammond's Plains. Currently, Johnson is serving time for charges including kidnapping, unlawful confinement, and attempted kidnapping. 
The charges came after Johnson kidnapped and confined a 20-year-old mentally disabled woman in 1997 in British Columbia and his attempts to pick up 12-year-old girls while posing as a police officer. Given that Andrew Paul Johnson was in Nova Scotia during the period of time when Leslie Ann Katnick went missing, I believe he is a possible suspect in this case. But for now, this dark secret and many others will likely remain locked away, deep in the mind of a sadistic killer. Any person with information regarding the disappearance of Leslie Ann Katnick should call the Rewards for Major Unsolved Crimes program at one 888 Seven one zero nine zero nine zero. May thirteenth, two thousand and one. Twenty nine year old Daryl Fernihoff goes missing. Daryl was seen at the nightclub NRG on Gottingen Street at one thirty AM and later observed at three forty AM running north on Gottingen Street in an area nearby the popular Marquee Club. Reportedly, Daryl had been out with friends this particular evening. Daryl is described as a white male, 5 foot 11 inches tall, 162 pounds, with blonde hair and blue eyes. He was last seen wearing jeans, dark shoes, and a green shirt. Daryl Fernahoff has had no contact with family or friends, and his bank account remains ominously untouched. Daryl Fernahoff was an individual who was well known and connected in the gay bar community and was partners with performance artist, actor, and filmmaker Johnny Terrace. He also worked as a butcher at the Queen Street Sobeys. In a bizarre coincidence, Brian George, who was also a gay man, also disappeared on the morning of Sunday, May 13, 2001. Brian George vanished after arguing with a friend at Reflections Cabaret. His bank account also remains untouched. Daryl lived on Portland Street in Dartmouth with his roommate Aaron McDonald. Daryl's parents, Shelley and Evelyn Fernahoff, described another individual living at the apartment, Aaron's baby daddy, whose name is unknown but apparently he owned a tattoo shop on Gottingen Street and was involved in the drug trade. After the man didn't pay rent or contribute, Daryl confronted Aaron and said, He goes or I go. Aaron's baby daddy went. After Daryl's disappearance, Aaron's ex assured her he knew nothing about what happened to Daryl. Not long after that, the man picked up and moved to British Columbia. Daryl apparently frequented the Halifax clubs often and would occasionally crash at an apartment belonging to his cousin, Kim McKeegan, and sister, Jamie, behind the Marquee Club. May 12, 2001, Saturday night, Daryl borrowed $5 and a spare apartment key from Kim and left for Club NRG. Jamie had gone to work, a job selling flowers at local bars. Reportedly, Aaron witnessed Daryl at NRG that night and wanted him to go home with her. Daryl told her that he would instead be spending the night at his cousin's. Daryl stayed at Club NRG until 1.30 a.m. At 3.30 a.m., Jamie witnessed Daryl running past her as she sat in a friend's car. Daryl was running toward the Marquee Club, but away from the apartment building. It would be three days before Daryl's parents and the police received this information. For Shelley Fernahoff, he's convinced that there was, and potentially still is, a serial killer operating in Halifax, and that this killer may be responsible for his son's homicide. Shelley's current wife, Diane, remembers Halifax police announcing the dissolution of their serial killer task force due to lack of funding just two days after Daryl went missing. Sadly, for Daryl's parents, Shelley and Evelyn Fernahoff, Mother's Day is a time of heartache. On Mother's Day in 1992, their daughter died of cancer. Nine years later, on Mother's Day in 2001, their son Daryl disappeared. Contact 902-490-5016 if you have information about the disappearance of Daryl Fernahoff. <laughs>
Troy Cook has been missing since June 12, 1998. At 10 a.m. on June 11, 1998, Troy Cook was dropped off near his apartment, 1 Victoria Street, Truro, Nova Scotia, by his father, Tom Cook. At 10.30 a.m., Mrs. Sharon Tucker, an employee at the Atlantic Superstore, received a phone call from a person claiming to be Troy Cook. Mrs. Tucker believed that the caller was Troy Cook, but recalled that he sounded different. The caller claiming to be Troy told her that he would not be in to work for his evening shift because he was feeling sick. Troy Cook has not been heard from since his disappearance, and there have been no confirmed sightings. He did not mention leaving town to anyone, and his wallet and ID were found in his apartment. There has also been zero transactions on his bank account. Troy is the oldest child of Tom and Lorraine Cook. He was just 19 years old at the time he vanished. Troy, his parents, and his younger brother Mike were all very close. Troy loved to camp, swim, and ride his motorbike. Troy was living in a two-bedroom flat on Willow Street in Truro, just a five-minute walk from his work. His roommate was a fellow co-worker at the Superstore. He had been living there just three weeks before his disappearance. Troy did not have a phone, so if he needed to contact his parents, he would call them from a payphone. On the evening of June 10, 1998, Troy stayed the night at his family home. On the morning of June 11, 1998, Tom Cook drove Troy back to his apartment. After dropping Troy off, Tom could see Troy walk towards his driveway, but he wasn't able to see the driveway or door. Tom couldn't even see if there were any cars parked in the driveway. He is uncertain if Troy made it inside his apartment. When Sharon Tucker got the call at the Atlantic Superstore, the call was linked to a phone booth located at the Tim Hortons in Bible Hill at Wright Avenue and Picto Road, roughly four to five kilometers from Troy's apartment and about a seven-minute drive and a 40-minute walk. Sharon Tucker stated the caller claiming to be Troy did sound sick, but Troy never mentioned this to anyone, including his father, who had just dropped him off 40 minutes earlier. On Friday, June 12, 1998, Troy's family all met up at a restaurant where Troy was also supposed to be, but he would never arrive. Tom Cook would wait 15 minutes before phoning Troy's workplace and friends. After being told by everyone that nobody had seen Troy, Tom would file a missing persons report with the Truro Police. Troy's father feels the Truro police didn't take the situation seriously and waited two to three days before beginning their investigation, losing precious time. After researching this story, I learned that after Troy had turned 19, he began frequenting a local nightclub called Chevy's, which had a reputation for drugs and where Troy had earned a reputation for approaching women, single or not. Could someone Troy met at the nightclub be connected to his disappearance? Did his roommate, who was 10 years older than Troy, know more than he was saying? It's yet another unsolved case in Nova Scotia that is screaming for answers. Any person with information regarding the disappearance of Troy Cook should call the Rewards for Major Unsolved Crimes program at one 710 9090 December 9, 2006, 6.20 a.m., 21-year-old David Hannon was found lying on the ground behind Harborview School in Dartmouth, Nova Scotia, by a passerby. He was unconscious, covered in blood, and had been badly beaten. He was taken to the hospital, but died just two days later. Investigations revealed that David had been at a house in Dartmouth with friends earlier that night, they think the assault happened where David was found. Fast forward to March 2011, David's younger brother, Trevor, shot their other brother, Brandon, in the stomach with a shotgun. He would plead guilty to charges of careless use of a firearm, aggravated assault, and breaching a firearms prohibition in relation to the shooting, which occurred in the brother's Albro Lake apartment. Trevor would be sentenced to 29 months in prison before being released in 2014. 
On the 15th of September in 2014, Trevor Hannon would be charged with the murder of his best friend, Daniel Pellerin. Daniel was discovered unconscious in a Dartmouth parking lot on August 24, 2014. He had been stabbed nine times and was later pronounced dead at the hospital. In court appearances following the arrest, heated exchanges took place between the Hannon and Pellerin families. In October 2014, RCMP had to respond to arson calls reported to have taken place at properties owned by the Pellerins. According to Daniel Pellerin's sister, Melissa Weir, Daniel came to know the Hannons through his friendship with David. After David's death, Daniel attempted to stay friends with the remaining two brothers. In December of 2018, Trevor was convicted of second-degree murder in connection with Daniel's death. An accomplice who was 15 at the time of Daniel's murder also pleaded guilty in 2015. Trevor was given a life sentence and cannot apply for parole until he served at least 15 years. The judge overseeing the case would go on to say, It is difficult to imagine why he would participate in this murder over a minimal drug debt when the victim was a longtime friend. It leads the court to suspect there is more to this than meets the eye in terms of motive in the dark side of that neighborhood. This is a tragic and strange case to say the least. Did Daniel Pellerin know something about David's murder? Was Trevor involved? Why did he shoot his other brother, Brandon? For now, all this, including the identity of David Hannon's killer, will remain a sad mystery. Any person with information regarding the murder of David Hannon should call the Rewards for Major Unsolved Crimes program at one 710 9090 You've been watching True Crime Mind Trap, and for anyone interested, check out our Patreon page. Any contributions will help directly in making more content. Link in the description below.